Okay, welcome, welcome both people here in person at Beagle and people connected on Zoom. Um, welcome to the British Institute of International Comparative Law. Uh, this is uh, one of the first events that uh, we organize uh, in person at uh, Beagle since, the, uh, since last year, and it's also one of the very first uh, um, events that we organize in this uh, hybrid form. So we have some people here uh, join us in, uh, in person in the audience and uh, um, about 30 participants now on, uh, on Zoom. So welcome to both audiences. Uh, also happy Thanksgiving Day. Somebody is uh, joining us from uh, from the US <laughs> and also we have an open here um, uh, as representation of uh, <laughs> America. And um, so today we are going to discuss uh, an issue around the convergence and divergence of uh, global data protection law. Um, the event is organized together with King's College London. Don Perry here, uh, our chair today, approached me with this uh, very interesting, tiny uh, idea. So we're happy that we were able to organize this event um, because uh, significant new data protection legislation has been passed recently in a number of uh, jurisdictions, uh, including, for example, in China, last August, uh, uh, the personal information protection law was adopted. In the United States, uh, a number of states legislature, um, including California, Virginia, and Colorado, have adopted uh, consumer data privacy law. This legislation has many um, common features, uh, for example, common concepts, uh, principles, also common rights and duty, as well as common remedies and, uh, and sanctions. So there is this strong evidence about this convergence, but you know, however similar this uh, concept may look like, then their implementation is actually quite different uh, in, of course, a different legal and political context. Uh, for example, the EU data protection law is rooted in uh, um, doctrine and jurisdiction in, new, in Europe about fundamental rights of privacy and data protection. Uh, why, in contrast, in the US, um, there is not an equivalent constitutional right to privacy, but at the same time, the First Amendment, uh, this free speech right uh, uh, has constrained the development of uh, data protection. So we will discuss this and uh, many other points with our expert today during the next hour and a half. Um, this panel conversation uh, will be followed by uh, question uh, session so there will be an opportunity for people in the audience of course to ask directly and uh, for people connected on zoom please write your question in the chat box so let me just introduce uh, our uh, panel here uh, perry keller uh, associate professor professor in uh, media and information law at king's college london is our chair today and then we had uh, Anupam Chander, <laughs> Professor of Law and Technology at Georgetown University Law Center. We're very lucky that uh, he's actually here in the UK <laughs> and not in the US. And then uh, we have uh, uh, Yahon Chen, uh, lecturer in law at the University of Sheffield. Also, thank you very much for traveling to from, uh, from Sheffield. And, um, and we have uh, uh, connected via Zoom uh, uh, Ingrid uh, uh, Schneider, that is a professor of political science at the University of uh, Hamburg. Okay, over to you. Irene, thank you very, very much. And um, welcome to everybody who's joined us by Zoom, as well as our in-person audience here. Uh, I think uh, this is really interesting to uh, forge further in the use of hybrid efforts to join different audiences, and uh, we will do our best to make sure everyone's involved today. So the first thing I want to say about this topic of divergence and convergence of global media law and what we're, sorry, global data protection law, and what we're trying to do today is that we are necessarily selective. So global is of course global and there's many aspects that we're not going to cover because we're going to primarily focus on Europe, the United States and China. Uh, but those are hugely influential in the development of global data protection law. And so whilst uh, we're very open to other questions that bring in other jurisdictions, I think these are fair to concentrate on these three. So what 
we'll do today is that I'm going to have a structured conversation with our guests rather than them doing presentations. I'm going to ask them a set of questions that will open up this issue and also hopefully stimulate issues and questions that you would like to comment on or, or raise questions about. And the first question to start us uh, going is really to begin with the Brussels effect, because if we can, we look out across the world and we see all sorts of new data protection legislation, and we see a lot of rule similarity, uh, as Irene was saying. And a lot of that then looks rather familiar uh, from a European perspective, although one could go back further and say the basic architecture that was developed in the 1970s of the Fairy Information Practice Principles, FIPS, um, is in some ways at the heart of the GDPR model. But of course, the European model embellishes that quite a bit. And we will look internationally, we're not only seeing the further spread of the FIPS model, but many European uh, adjustments to that. So the first question then has to be whether or not the Brussels effect is of, however, first question might be, how important has it been? And will it continue to have the importance it's had in the past? Um, or is this uh, a moment that's passed and we are moving from convergence, apparent convergence, through to possible uh, divergence as the rules begin to develop differently in different contexts. And uh, one of the things to be said about the argument for the Brussels effect and how it's supposed to work and going back to the work of Anu Bradford is it's not just about rules, it's about values that European Union rules and the underlying principles and values that uh, make those rules function in legal regimes are exported. And they're not only taken up by foreign governments, but they're also taken up by uh, foreign companies who see that uh, they present a, a basis in which to provide global uh, commercial solutions. And Apple would be a very good example of a company that you would say that has experienced the Brussels effect and made that a, a business model. The questions then I'll lead to now are really about uh, what are those context differences and do they matter? And how much further influence will there be from the still evolving European model? So I'd like to start with Ingrid, if you could give a, a European perspective on the influence of the European model in the past, and, and what further influence do you think it's likely to have in the global development of data protection law? Okay, thank you very much, uh, first, for the invitation and for having me here. Uh, can you hear me rightly? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I would assert that the Brussels effect has indeed been significant, and I would say that it's even still growing in importance. I mean, if you imagine um, that the first data protection law was in the German state of Hessen in 1970, uh, in the last 50 years, data protection has become a major achievement and a huge success story. I think uh, especially GDPR has become a global gold standard and a model of reference for many other countries. So uh, to date, we have 140 countries with comprehensive regulation and 93 of them with uh, also data protection authorities. So almost all Latin American states have it, Brazil, Mexico, also some Asian and West African countries and jurisdictions such as India have pending bills or initiatives as do also other countries. And I think the, the almost white spot is indeed the US, uh, one of the few countries which does not have a nationwide federal comprehensive data protection legislation, but of course uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act and in some other states, um, they have passed a similar bill, which is also a, a little bit oriented um, to the GDPR. And I think the CCPA would not have been possible without this uh, G, um, GDPR. And um, so in many countries, for instance, in Latin America, they have also taken up data protection and private privacy as a constitutional right. Uh, 
and have passed data protection laws, for instance, in Mexico. Um, but most of them do not have an extraterritorial clause. So in a nutshell, I would say I see a lot of convergence in the overall concept of data protection law but also a lot of divergence and some serious deficits in the enforcement and implementation of the law. So I think there's still a long and stony road ahead. And I think the main problem also in Europe is enforcement um, because in, the, in Europe, of course, it's mainly the Irish, Irish um, data protection authority, which is handling the so-called GAFAM cases, and it's way too slow and very much too cautious to act properly on those big tech companies. So the cohesion principle and the one-stop shop, which are nice ingredients um, and elements, fundamental elements of the GDPR do not work properly and need to be reformed. And I think another problem which Creates a, creates a lot of uh, divergence and also dissatisfaction is the lack of stuff and resources. For instance, in, in my state, city state, the Hamburg um, data protection officer has only 20 staff people to deal with complaints, with inspections, with advice, and with tech giants like Google and Facebook. And this is far too little. Um, and also um, these enforcement problems also prevail in other jurisdictions. For instance, Latin American countries complain about forum shopping of, com of companies who just transfer their servers to the US and thus cannot be held liable for data protection infringements. So both domestic and foreign companies engage in forum shopping for the lowest and least binding privacy standards. And um, so I think in that respect, there's a lot to do. Um, but I would also emphasize that uh, in the GDPR, the market location principle, which implies the extraterritorial reach of the GDPR is of fundamental importance. And um, I think, um, Moreover, GDPR principles are also enshrined in international trade agreements. So the effect of the GDPR goes beyond Europe and it becomes also an element of international standard setting. So um, yeah, I think the Brussels effect is still uh, fundamentally working but it's also, of course, based on economic power, the large size of the European single market, and this might change in a few decades. China may take over and we are going to have a Beijing effect. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you very much. So given that you've made um, some uh, interesting comments about developments in the United States, I think I'd best turn to and of Pam to address those, and, and they would be two-sided, really. One is to ask, well, do you, to what extent do you think there's been a European uh, effect? Are we just reading too much into it? Is, is already because of the development of the, the Fairman inf Information Practice Principles in the United States in the 70s, that there's some, there was already a bit of trajectory in this direction anyway. And then also, uh, what do you think are, are the main areas for uh, a, a lack of convergence and indeed potentially divergence uh, despite developments in California, Virginia, Colorado? Great. Uh, so I do agree with everything that Ingrid has said. I think that the European Union has shown a tremendous uh, kind of leadership in uh, global data protection issues, data privacy issues, and uh, been a catalyst for uh, data protection law across the world. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, I think it's true that uh, many jurisdictions have often modeled their laws on the GDPR. Even China's law is largely finds its roots in the GDPR, not in an American style approach. 
uh, and uh, and I think in some ways goes beyond the GDPR, uh, and so so uh, it's it's striking, uh, and I I think that it has been remarkably successful uh, as uh, as a kind of global effect. We should also remember its its power within the European Union. Uh, when the data protection directive was first started to be formulated, many European states that were European communities members lacked uh, data protection law themselves. So mm -hmm. it began by requiring everyone in, in Europe to create data protection law, which was uh, absent uh, in, uh, you know, so uh, as Ingrid points out, Hess begins in 1970, 6970 with a uh, data protection law, and then it uh, you know, propagates through uh, France and, and Germany and, and a number of other jurisdictions, a number of jurisdictions do not adopt a uh, data protection law uh, until it's clear that the European community is going to mandate this essentially uh, at, a, at, a, at a European level. So it's been a tremendously powerful engine for creating data protection law across the world. One question is whether or not this is a kind of, uh, what the rationale is. Is this because you convinced us that the law is right, or is it because we want to engage in trade? Uh, mm -hmm. And so the adequacy system within Europe says essentially you can't uh, have easy access to data from, the, from Europe without uh, showing us the essentially equivalent law. That is a powerful pull, a powerful carrot, or seen another way, a powerful stick uh, to cause you to take on this law. So the economic interests involved um, you know, are also in play. Ingrid described this as a fundamental right, the right to privacy. There's always, I always worry when we talk about fundamental rights because when we talk about fundamental rights, they're often written in constitutions, but they're often not practiced in the real in, on the street. And so the fact that there are legal fundamental rights proclaimed, uh, you know, the Soviet Union had more rights than anyone else. Uh, and, you know, and so I want to be cautious of not kind of conflating the existence of a formal right in a constitution with uh, a real right in the streets. Now, the United States does have a fundamental right to privacy. It, it's a one against the state. Um, and so we do, we do have robust privacy laws against the US government, constitutional and as federal statutes that protect uh, American the American public, and this is the problem in the Schrems litigation, that they protect the American public, not other publics, uh, against the American government. Uh, and so, and by the way, that problem also exists in laws across the world. We're not the only ones that don't give rights to foreigners against our uh, surveillance apparatus. Um, so so uh, I'll bracket that issue, the Schrems uh, uh, line to issue. Uh, but uh, so I think that yes, in fact, there's a huge amount of uh, of, uh, uh, of global convergence towards infection that is very much because of Brussels' early action in 1995 with the data protection directive uh, and uh, revived even I mean more robust with the uh, GDPR uh, that came back in 2018. I do think that the United States is a laggard overall because we don't have this, we don't have a comprehensive rule, privacy law against private actors um, at, at a national level. We have sectoral uh, as opposed to omnibus uh, law. Uh, and I think that is uh, a problem. I think it's gonna become a worse problem as now three states have different privacy laws across uh, across uh, the United States. Um, this is only going to proliferate further uh, and it's going to require some effort to create a national privacy law. Um, and the issue with the United States is two issues of uh, a private, uh, an ability to bring a private action uh, and whether or not state laws will be preempted by the, the national law. 
Um, so there are two kind of sticking points to coming up with a federal law. Uh, so I think there is some desire to have a national law. The question is whether you can get people to agree on what the, what, uh, the national law looks like. So at this point right now, unfortunately, we don't have uh, a national law that seems likely to, to come into it. Thank you, Anupam. That, that sparked many questions in my mind, but I'd like to, to move to China and ask Jia Hong, please, to bring in the perspective because, of course, there's the personal information protection law, has been said, was passed in July, but uh, of course, also came into force very quickly, the 1st of November. And uh, in many ways, reading the actual language, the text, you can say, well, this, this looks a lot in certain ways like the GDPR, but um, is that, does that reflect deep influence or do you think it's a, a, a more superficial influence? I think, I think I'll tend to agree with uh, Ingrid um, and Perry that if you look at the actual text of the uh, personal information protection law, uh, you will see very heavy influence from the GDPR. Uh, for example, uh, something as general as the data protection principles or uh, things as specific as things like um, the idea of joint controllership um, or even household exemption. You can see the influence of the GDPR um, and also things like the right to data portability. So you can, I think it will be even fair to say that these are very much a copy and paste from the European legislation. Um, and I think to that extent, uh, I think I would agree that there is indeed a Brussels effect uh, from the Chinese perspective. Um, however, I think we should also look at other aspects um, of, the, of the legislation and its enforcement. And, uh, and I think uh, Anupam make this very um, insightful point about the rationale behind taking the Brussels effect, right? Is it because, uh, well, the Chinese policymakers, do you think this is the best model? Or is it because they think adopting some of the European rules can actually promote some of their own policy goals, right? And I think that's where we can start um, see we start to see some of the divergence, right? So for example, um, when it comes to data exports or data localization, there is a system um, under the GDPR or before that, the, Europe, uh, the Data Protection Directive, um, any cross-border data transfers outside the EU is subject to restrictions, right? Now, if you look at um, the personal information protection law of China, you will see something similar. However, there is a significant difference there. So under European law, um, I think there are, the, the system is complex, right? But I think in a nutshell, as long as you get the data subjects consent, the data can go outside the EU. If you look at the Chinese law, however, you will need the consent. And on top of that, you will also need the prior approval from the authority. So it just made me think that this is probably something about, well, national security, national interest. So I think it would even be fair to say that um, the Chinese policymakers saw the value of the data localization rules in the GDPR and adopted it and adapted it to a way that can promote their own policy goal, which in this case, I think, um, is um, national security and national interest. So from that point of view, I think there are certain, there are certainly some uh, divergences there. I think uh, if you look at how the entire sort of Chinese data protection system might be based on a completely different justification um, or policy rationale, uh, you will start to see some of those differences. I think another example I should mention here is uh, enforcement. And enforcement is not just an issue in Europe. Uh, but I think it would be it would be a very sort of serious concern um, in other countries, including China as well. 
Um, so in terms of enforcement, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the recent and independent authority under the Chinese law to enforce um, the data collection legislation there. Uh, instead, the one of the ministries will be the responsible um, authority to enforce uh, the law. So that is another significant sort of departure from the European system. And I think that might come back to the point that it's it, it's it's all about it's all about protecting individual interest that is in line with national interest as well. And maybe that is why an independent authority might come in the way, right? It, in some cases anyway. So I think that is another reason why you will see that major difference um, under the Chinese legislation. But I think overall, it would be fair to say um, we can see the influence from the European model at the same time. Um, the Chinese legislation has also departed slightly from the direction. Um, and in, on some aspects, that is uh, particularly uh, evident. I'll just uh, put it there. Thank you, Jiao Hong. That, well, that's really interesting. I think our three speakers have like spilled a lot of issues out in front of us. And I, I'd like to start picking up some of those and, uh, and adding some others as we go forward. So. Uh, to pick up one, and I'll start with the United States and China, and then bring this back to you, Ingrid, uh, from a European perspective, is so we'll just pick up this issue of fundamental rights and constitutional rights. And, and uh, within the European data protection regime, of course, uh, fundamental rights have been critically important, not only from a kind of values point of view, but also, of course, in the practicalities of what the GDPR uh, the e-privacy e directive, et cetera, what they mean, whether that's in international transfers and data retention or even more mundane sort of issues like joint controllership. But with that is a particular kind of doctrine of, of uh, interpretation, necessity and proportionality. And so to what extent, you know, is that a, um, an undigestible part of the European regime from a US or a Chinese perspective. And uh, so maybe Ancom, if you could talk about that from the US perspective. So it's typically not the approach that American data privacy law takes. So if you look at the California law, that's not the way it's framed. It's framed in terms of rights that citizens have, um, you know, which are again, this fair information practice based rights. So very much still kind of, uh, 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 self-determination model, uh, a model where you're told what information is collected, you allow for that collection, um, and you have, the, you have some rights over the data that's collected about you, uh, but it's not based on a kind of uh, necessity and proportionality test. Uh, that's not the, the ways that um, the, uh, the uh, rules that a corporation can use, et cetera, or frame or judge. So that's not the typical framing. Um, I think it's a great question about these core principles that guide the regulators setting the particular rules, you know, because we all agree on these kind of broad principles, but at the same time, it's when you have to instantiate them into rulemaking for, you know, advertising or, you know, et cetera. It, it, it suddenly your, uh, the differences between your normative vision, your underlying vision become very salient. And so I think that uh, there, you know, so California has of course amended its law to become even stricter uh, with uh, uh, a new law that comes into effect in 2023. There's a regulatory body that's just been created. Um, so we're gonna see more and more regulations. So we don't know which way the regulators will, what they will ultimately do. So it's, it's plausible that regulators could adopt these kinds of principles, uh, but there is no statutory mandate or jurisprudential mandate for them to do so. Can I just follow up very quickly with um, two quick questions? One is, do you think the First Amendment, the right to free speech, which has been involved in some litigation that's gone to Supreme Court, uh, 
limiting data protection law is do you think that's in the future going to be significant and just a small point well Cal the california constitution article one has a right to privacy is that of no significance so this is again you know this question of a constitutional right there is a constitutional right even against private parties in california under the state constitution uh and so now what does that mean over the last 50 years before we had the you know ccpa we didn't get anything you know particular uh with respect to data protection in california even though there was a constitutional right uh for you know under the state constitution um and so i, I i'm always like keen on you know not just is it in the constitution but what is the actual implementation of, of that of such right and by the way even for many jurisdictions that have ostensibly adopted the gdpr model there's very little act ingrid was talking about this there's very little actual enforcement going on in many jurisdictions across the world uh, mm -hmm. and so there it seems really to me it this is the kind of the typical approach which is there's a human rights treaty we'll sign on to it uh, and then we'll put it in, in the bottom drawer uh, and so, so that that approach is something that we have to be cautious about because it's the practical reality of what your rights are that ultimately matter. Um, I, so you're absolutely right. The California Constitution does provide uh, this, um, and it's only now that we're starting to see some reality uh, on the ground in California with now a real data protection authority. There's talk quite uh, amazingly to me I, I was shocked at the possibility when i first heard it uh, you know, maybe about a year and a half ago about the possibility of california getting an adequacy ruling on its own um, and uh, and i think it's actually now I've decided that it's actually possible it's actually plausible and it may be even justifiable in the future that's well very interesting well with ashkan sultani as the new head of the uh the california's uh Data privacy. I can't remember the exact title of the agency, but at any rate, uh, a very strong privacy activist at the top of that would be very interesting. So, um, Jia Hong, uh, you know, under my understanding, you know, constitutional rights in China are mainly expressed through lawmaking. They're not necessarily not regarded as being justiciable, therefore, lawmakers to take into consideration. But, and therefore, you wouldn't have a, a, a kind of direct parallel for courts using necessity and proportionality. But are those concepts of any relevance when one thinks of big protection law in, in China? Um, I think I think we should start by acknowledging there is no constitutional review in under the Chinese system. So I think something like the court striking down the uh, data data retention directive or striking down the um, safe harbor or privacy shield decision would be something completely unimaginable under the Chinese system. However, um, the judicial system um, in China, well, at least in, in when it comes to private sector use of personal data, has indeed exercised um, quite some creativity in terms of interpreting um, the primary legislation, not necessarily the constitution itself, uh, but major primary um, uh, primary legislation. So, for example, uh, I think last year there was this case brought before a court by um, by a law professor in China against the use of um, facial recognition technologies in a zoo. Right. The court uh, supported the claim. Uh, ordering the, the zoo to pay the damage to the, um, to, the, to, the, to the claimant and also to delete the data, right? Um, now the court made that decision not based on the personal information protection law, which just came into force earlier this month, right? Um, it made that decision based on a very generic principle in consumer protection law. So what I'm trying to say is mm -hmm. there is a scope for the judicial system to sort of interpret some of the general principles in a very specific way that can actually protect individual interests in some cases. 
Now, a few months after that, um, that decision made by a local court, the Supreme Court actually issued a guidance. Um, and, and, and for those in the audience who are not familiar with the Chinese judicial system, the guidance issued by the Supreme Court um, is binding on lower courts. Right? So in that guidance, and I think it would be fair to say it bans uh, facial recognition in private sector. Uh, so you can see actually in some areas, the Chinese courts are taking even, you know, one step ahead of the, um, of the Europeans. So I should emphasize that's only in the private sector. Right? When it comes to public sector use of personal data, that would be a completely different story. Um, so yes, yeah, so coming back to the question of constitutional review of, of fundamental rights, I think it would be very hard to imagine something uh, similar to the European or even the American system. But um, based on primary legislation, which which is always very generic, vague, and unspecific, and um, there is there is a lot of legal uncertainty. But the bright side is there is also a scope for the courts to, uh, to take actions, so. Well, thank, thank you, Jia Hong. Ingrid, what, what do you think from coming back to European perspective is, and the, you know, the importance of fundamental rights as really, as I said before, in the practice of data protection law within the European regime and, and the difficulties of exporting this, the whole package to outside of a system that's not governed in the end by the CJEU. Yeah, um, of course, um, in, in the EU, data protection is a fundamental right. It's enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights in two articles, in Article 7 and in Article 8. So, um, and I think data protection has a double meaning in Europe. It's uh, meant to protect citizens from the state's intrusion on privacy, but also to protect them by the state, also vis-a-vis -vis private corporations. So in that respect, I think that's the main difference. I think in the US, privacy is primarily understood in a very liberal or even libertarian way of liberty from the state's intrusion. And also the CCPA is directed not it's directed at consumers, but not as citizens in itself. And I think there's also, um, I think a different understanding of liberty in the US, it's mainly negative liberty, whereas in Europe, we also have the notion of a positive liberty. So in, in terms of taking control of one's life, in terms of informational self-determination and in terms of realizing one's fundamental purposes. So um, in that respect, I think there is a fundamental difference also when it comes to judicial review. And of course, I think the CJEU has played an important role also in developing the ideas, the fundamental ideas of data protection even further. For instance, in, um, in establishing this right to be forgotten I think this was a major step. Um, and there will be also other forms of judicial review, which are fundamental, I think, in Europe to, to preserve the idea of privacy as a fundamental right. And also pushing, for instance, back against uh, forms of state intrusion. Um, there have been significant decisions by the CGAU in that respect. So um, I think the fundamental, uh, the fundamental difference between the European and the Chinese model, of course, is that the European model is both directed to protect citizens uh, from the state, but also to protect citizens from uh, private corporations, whereas the Chinese model is only to protect citizens from uh, too much power or too much intrusion in terms of, of private corporations, as private as they are in China. But when it comes um, to, of course, to the state, I think if we consider the social credit system, the internet censorship, um, 
and many other aspects of China's reality today, today we may call into question the trustworthiness and integrity of the Chinese data protection law and its attention. So I think it's more, I think nowadays, um, a power play also between the state, the power of state and private corporations. And of course, this also has geopolitical geopolitical ramifications, because nowadays there's a lot of talk about a new Cold War between the US and China and European trying to find a third way of acting and also leading, um, leading ahead in having another idea uh, about how the whole digital and internet system should work in terms of business models and all that. So I think this is in the background of all the discussions about data protection law these days. Thank you, Ingrid. That, that's a very helpful and interesting. Um, though I, I, I should say, and, and just to, to possibly preempt Jia Hong, it, it is interesting that personal information protection law in China does, uh, in a very kind of groundbreaking way, introduce the concept that public bodies will be subject to data protection responsibilities. It's a very scanty part, but that is, you know, it, it is opens up the potential for at least some aspects of the state to, uh, to begin to adopt uh, elements of data protection. Now, what I'd like to do now is we've I've sort of emphasized somewhat of the negative in what I was saying, you know, driving towards more of the divergence and some of the problems of, sort of taking this very complex European model and expecting it to thrive somewhere else without some of the indigenous characteristics. Uh, so, but I, I wanna turn things now to something which all these systems share is, a, is particularly on the consumer side of a heavy reliance on uh, notice and consent in different ways, uh, less so on the governmental side. So, if we look at, for example, in terms of behavioral advertising and the efforts to regulate behavioral advertising, uh, we can see that the, the basic model is heavily reliant on the idea that if consumers are sufficiently informed and in a, uh, a way that is done that is not set out to deceive them and their choices are made clear enough, that people will make the choices. And this will achieve that essential kind of informational self-determination to use that European phrase that is supposed to be the essence of data protection. However, there is, as we know, a huge problem with simple the uh, information overload and people's inability to digest the amount of information, setting aside all the issues about dark patterns and all the ways in which people are very uh, subtly and not so subtly maneuvered to make particular choices. So that leads to my major question, and, and it really starts with Colorado, where very interestingly, part of the Colorado legislation is to require, uh, I think it's by 2024, if I've got my dates right, that uh, states that, that businesses that are subject to the, Col the Colorado Privacy Act will be required to um, accept signals given by global privacy control uh, settings this were ways in which the idea is that you would be able to give settings that would be uh, for browsers, but also apps in which your basic preferences are set and that the business that received those, whether they're websites or apps or whatever, uh, would need to and would be required to respond to those. So it seems to me that's the, the basis is, is that as the ICO in Britain, who's also raise some of this themselves and are very interested in these kind of solutions, this will require international cooperation because of the cross-border nature of many of these businesses. So a long-winded way of coming to my question is, what is the possibility for this? Do you think that this is something where you could see cooperation really between a number of jurisdictions, including China, the United States, and the EU? So uh, if, if I kind of, um, take it back to you at this point and say, what do you think there's an interest in these kind of technical solutions in China? And what's the appetite for trying to configure those in ways that might operate uh, across borders? Or is that really not part of the kind of the regulatory perspective in China? 
I, I'm really not that optimistic uh, when it comes to when it comes to sort of going beyond consent, right? Uh, I think I think Perry was right to say that uh, the Chinese system, the Chinese legislation, focuses a lot on consent as well, and it does borrow some uh, some concepts from the GDPR in terms of what counts as valid consent, right? So, uh, for example. Uh, you can't refuse to provide service to a user just because they don't consent to the use of data that is not necessary for the provision of the service so i think again it's fair to say um, that provision in the new law is a replication or borrow from uh, from the gdpr and also the users would have the right to withdraw consent uh, so these things are sort of positive um, in the text of the law. However, um, the personal information protection law has not defined the concept of consent. And I am really sort of skeptical of how the enforcement or interpretation of the concept of consent can take into account of um, of the internet world where everyone just consent anyway, right? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that the legislators were mindful of the sort of the technical solutions that are available. Um, and, um, and that's why I'm, I'm feeling a little bit quite pessimistic uh, when it comes to, um, when it comes to sort of, you know, going beyond the traditional idea of notice and consent. Uh, under the Chinese legislation. However, um, I think I should mention um, under that new law, users, uh, I should say internet users, have the right to opt out of personalized targeting. And I think that is something new um, or new ish across the world, uh, a specific explicit right to opt out of personalized advertising. Uh, and I am hoping uh, enforcers of the law and courts could sort of take that as an opportunity to mandate some sort of more effective mechanism for um, users to give consent, to withdraw consent, or to object to the use of personal data for these purposes. But um, having said all of these things, um, I'm still not very optimistic, to be honest. Okay, that's interesting. I'll, I don't problem. I'll keep you in the because uh, with I should have not only call it Colorado, but the amendments to the CCPA brought in by the California Private Right Privacy Rights Act of 2020 also introduced a similar uh, basis for a requirement for the reception of global privacy control signals. So this being a, a more kind of US innovation, then I'll take to Ingrid and, and ask, you know, from the European perspective, do you see that this is uh, something that has traction in Europe and, and is likely at least to give rise to transatlantic cooperation, although Jiao Hong is, has said less likely in relation with China? Um, yes, I think um, at least the idea, uh, it might be expressed differently in Europe, but of course problems with respect to targeted advertising, also the, the question, does data minimization and purpose limitation um, still hold in the era of AI? These are common questions, I think, in all the jurisdictions. So in that respect, I think, for instance, in, in Europe, we have several proposals now by the European Commission. And I think the idea of somehow uh, stopping um, targeted advertising is um, very much debated now in the European Parliament when it comes to the AI regulation. So, uh, and there are a number of other issues, I think, which also concern uh, discrimination and stigmatization of citizens, um, which are not directly related to the individual citizen, uh, but also to groups or collectives which are just created by stratified forms of uh, profiling. These are questions which um, 
are not yet or not sufficiently tackled by the GDPR. So in that respect, I think the European initiatives, uh, the AI Act, the Data Services um, Act, the Data Market Act, and also the Data Governance Act are initiatives which I see as more complementary to tackle these questions of the uh, new regime of the internet and new governance forms. So in that respect, um, I think the, the informed consent in the GDPR has been important when it comes to individual rights to withdraw, to, to keep some control over the information which is collected about you, uh, which is available about you. But I think all these ideas of informational self-determination in terms of uh, making clear just when you open up a website and there will be 80 cookies and third parties receiving information about you, data brokers also having lots of information they are collecting. So in that respect, even you know, Facebook likes um, will also create lots of profiles. Um, and I think this has been insufficiently tackled by the GDPR, but I'm a bit optimistic that it will be tackled by the AI Act, at least when it comes to the so-called high risk applications of AI. But of course, this is law in the making and we, there is a lot of lobbying now going on, a lot of negotiations. So we will see what's coming out uh, when, when these laws will be passed. But I think um, in terms of a risk-based approach, approach to regulation, um, I think this is something which could complement the GDPR in terms of really taking into, the count, into account uh, the processes of data, dealing with data, data processing. And it's not only related to individual risks or individual willingness to provide data or to withhold them, but um, it puts its emphasis on certain types of AI systems, on transparency rules, also on issues like biometric system, facial recognition in public spaces, which will be probably prohibited, or also social scoring practices are considered as unacceptable risk. So in that respect, there are new requirements also in terms of documentation uh, for, for companies uh, which want to use forms of profiling, pattern recognition and prediction. So in that respect, I think there is some hope that it, it's not just a um, consent uh, notification, uh, notification but there are other forms of trying to get some control and some regulation of practices which are considered unfundamental or um, adverse to fundamental rights and also to give back some more control to citizens themselves, but also to have the idea that the state um, has certain, or the European Union has certain fundamental values which so, should not be violated by technical systems. Thank you, Ingrid, that, that's really helpful. And um, so, you know, to pick up what you were saying, I think one of the questions, and I, I do want to come back to global privacy control as well, but they, they as you nicely pointed out, it all hinges together because one is with global privacy control, this kind of technical solutions is really within the existing framework of data protection law. But there's this other hanging question which you've just introduced and that is whether or not the shift to the regulation of artificial intelligence, which is going to be uh, progressively important in so many aspects of the processing of personal data, that that is, you know, potentially uh, another uh, Brussels effect issue uh, where the EU's uh, apparent lead on this issue in the, this kind of framework of digital constitutionalism uh, with, within the EU is something that that will be carried forward. But I want to hold on to that and just come back to the United States because I think that you know, it's, it is a very hot issue in the States in relation to consumer data privacy at the moment. 
Uh, so unemployment people. Sure. So this goes back to an earlier question as well that you asked me about the First Amendment and um, whether or not there's a kind of uh, the demands of U.S. privacy law uh, might conflict with First Amendment constitutional obligations. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, Ingrid mentioned the right to be forgotten as a signal achievement of the CJEU. Um, and I don't think a right to be forgotten in that form is really possible in the United States because this would be seen as an infringement of the person who is forced to forget. Um, and so it would be for, it would be seen as a right, as a violation of that person's free expression rights. Uh, and so so uh, uh, the, so I think and this raises more general questions as well about sometimes the the tension between privacy rights and other interests that we might have. Uh, so we think about the the kind of profiling that uh, Joe Hong was talking about. Sometimes it's important for us to know that the same guy is coming back on and harassing the, you know, using lots of different uh, uh, accounts to harass people. Uh, and so you need to be able to follow that person, even if that person himself or herself doesn't want to be followed. Uh, and so, you know, there needs to be uh, some ability to manage those, those uh, kinds of tensions as well. So sometimes, you know, a, a, a requirement that we not collect any information can lead to its own set of problems as well. Um, but that with respect to the, the global content controls uh, question, uh, I do think that these are the kinds of technical solutions that technologists have long advocated. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, you know, Tim Berners-Lee for a long time advocated a kind of, uh, PPP, uh, I've forgotten what it was called, what it stands for now, uh, uh, but some kind of, uh, you tell your electronic agent what you are willing to negotiate about privacy, and it goes out and negotiates your privacy on your behalf. Uh, and uh, it's a kind of automated negotiation system. And so this is a kind of uh, uh, a simple simplification of, you know, just do not track, essentially, uh, across, uh, across the internet space. And I think this is still very much a kind of liberal model, a consent model. You know, I choose that I do not want to be trapped. Uh, and so, so that's the, as opposed to the information overload problem that you're talking about, which is we need more paternalism. We need to say these kinds of things are unacceptable. These practices are just prohibited and we don't need to, uh, we don't require the individual to protect himself or herself against them. Uh, this question arises in the you know, dark patterns. Uh, but interestingly, I visited uh, the British Museum uh, and I saw an example of a kind of dark pattern in the UI. Uh, so the first thing it does, it's, it's the first choice is pay, uh, uh, pay five pounds for the ticket. Um, and parenthetically, that five pounds is a donation. Uh, and so later on, only when you scroll down quite a bit, you can see that it's actually the ticket is actually free, uh, and you can you know just go there for free. Uh, and that is kind of dark pattern. That I actually didn't mind. I don't mind. You know? mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting question about what do we think about? You know, it's definitely an intentional UI design um, uh, pushing you towards uh, thinking that you are required to make this five pound uh, donation. Uh, as it turns out. Uh, and so I think these are, these. it will become, um, I think a kind of, uh, uh, these things will affect a lot of practices on the ground. At the New York Times, uh, Ingrid pointed out, you know, the 80 trackers, et cetera. I went, I just before this, I love doing this. Uh, I was checking the New York, check, you know, I have subscribed to the New York Times for decades since I graduated from law school, I've subscribed, uh, and that's been decades, unfortunately. Uh, and, uh, but the New York Times, you know, has 60 trackers, 60 cookies that it leaves uh, when I use it. Uh, and so it's not just a business model, uh, you, know, uh, you know, New York Times makes a lot of money from me from, uh, from my subscription fees, but it also makes money by 
uh, personalizing its advertising to it. Uh, and so, you know, so I think we want to be, I think the idea that if we change the business model, we've solved the privacy problems is actually too much, uh, puts too much weight on the business model. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of business models that have a lot of privacy problems, and it's not just the, the business models that are depend upon free services. Uh, and so uh, in, they're just entirely advertising support. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, uh, Anupam. Uh, so at this point, we've been talking then about uh, the evolution of the idea of personal choice and personal control. And we can see in the three jurisdictions, there's various struggles around that. There's a possibility of technical developments. I can throw in that uh, these wonderful new developments that you hear about, whether in American law or the potential in the privacy regulation about uh, that prohibitions of tracking and targeting, but they all tend to be really focused on third party tracking. That actually first party relationships are largely untouched. They're still in the basic notice consent model. So you can be in Apple's world and uh, it's very nice that others aren't tracking you, but Apple knows a very uh, a lot about you. And we don't call that tracking. Uh, it's simply a part of your being observed and inferred within your relationship with Apple. So just throwing in the, the to dispel the idea that the, these new, really nice sounding prohibitions on targeting and tracking are as universal as, as, as they might sound to be. So all of that being the case, I mean, is from what Ingrid was saying further, and uh, I'll, I'll take it to you and bring it back to Ingrid, um, is, is really the, the direction of travel in terms of convergence going to be towards more paternalism? And that's really shifting out of data protection. It's had its moment. It'll always be there. It's going to be part of this. But just for some of the reasons we've been talking about and the uncertainties of, well, we know that dark patterns are really important to the confusion of people. But how do we define those? Because they go from everything to gentle kinds of persuasion to quite manipulative uh, things, and deceptions. So all that to say is like AI regulation is that the direction of travel? Uh, we're going to be identifying risks and prohibit them, set conditions on them, and that is going to be fairly straightforward you know, regulation. And individuals, as empowered with rights and remedies, are not going to have a, a very big role in these new phases. I don't know what, uh, maybe Zhao Hong, do you think that yeah, I think I think my observation is uh, a lot of countries are actually moving towards the more paternalistic sort of direction. Um, and just to give you an example, uh, again, under the new Chinese law, uh, so unfair price discrimination based on personal data is prohibited. And, uh, and I've already mentioned um, facial recognition, uh, at least. In, in the private sector is heavily restricted um, already. So it seems to me that um, governments around the world are, are now realizing that there are things that we can't leave to individuals. So there, there, there needs to be a degree of paternalism. Uh, but the question always is how, how far do we want to go, right? We don't want, you know, the state to make all the decisions for us. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's just very interesting to see how some of the issues uh, in some jurisdictions are left to individuals to decide, whereas in other countries, uh, they are sort of subject to very strict uh, scrutiny by the authority. Uh, and again, I think uh, the data um, digital localization is a good example, right? So. Um, like I said, under the new Chinese um, personal information protection law, individual consent is not enough for a data controller to export the data uh, outside the territory, right? You will still need the approval from the state. So I think, yes, I think um, it would be fair to say at least 
from the Chinese perspective, uh, we are seeing a lot of journalism. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jia Hong. So, Anupam, you know, you know, to take Jia Hong's point there and sort of thrust it into the, con you know, the, the melee that is the US Congress to say, you know, does paternalism have any, any hope of passing through uh, in the United States? So the, can you envision a shift towards more government regulation that is more paternalistic and really shifts away from the model of, you know, empowering the individual? So it's, I would have said no, because I would have thought uh, Republicans would largely be against a kind of paternalism uh, and would be for business freedom. Were it not for the fact that Republicans today are pissed off at Facebook and Google and Twitter for banning Donald Trump. That changes the politics of the American Congress. Uh, so this is not about principle, it's about politics, as so that makes evident, um, and leads to a much more uh, uh, activist Congress um, inclination against what they see as big tech. Uh, and so which is from the Republican side, squashing Republican voices on the Democratic side, not squashing enough Republican voices. Um, and so uh, kind of hard to imagine how do you square that circle, uh, but, uh, but, that's the, but that's the possibility. And I do think that that means that we now have um, uh, the government regulators that the Senate has approved uh, by, in a bipartisan fashion who are strongly anti-big tech. Uh, and so it may not, the, the rules aren't going to come from Congress per se, but they will come from the regulators. So I think you have the most zealous group of, uh, of regulators probably in the world, um, you know, that are, uh, that are anti-big tech in the home of big tech. Uh, and so, so you see this in California, uh, you see this in, uh, not in the politics of the California Assembly, but the California, the constitution of the, of the leadership of the California Privacy uh, uh, Data Protection Authority, essentially, uh, and the the uh, also in especially the FTC. Uh, Major uh, problem. Yes. Uh, so and with Tim Wu in the White House, uh, you know, huge kind of uh, uh, concerted effort. Uh, across the administration that is going to target tech in a particular way that I think will have some of these uh, paternalistic things. And going back to what Jai Hong was saying, look, here, just to give me an example. He said, you can't discriminate, uh, you can't do price discrimination, uh, you know, uh, on certain grounds. That means essentially that Alibaba can't charge five people five different prices for the same shirt. Uh, and so, so that's a very practical thing that I think if you went to people across the world, most people would say, yes, that should be a paternalistic rule that I would favor. Uh, and so, because I didn't even know that was possible. Uh, and so, and I can't, I don't have the ability to protect against that myself. Uh, and so, so here, this, I mean, so I know that uh, the Chinese model has lots of problems, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of innovation actually also happening in China. And there is real consumer protection that is very much part of that uh, enterprise. Uh, and so, uh, so I think it, there is a huge regulatory shift. Yes, ultimately it's in the interest of the state, but it's also a state trying to make sure that people aren't unhappy with the state because the state failed to protect them in some way. Thank you both. And so, so coming back to Ingrid, uh, then Ingrid, can you just reflect for a moment then on this idea that, um, that we could see, as you were talking about before, the importance of things like the Digital uh, Services Act and with it, the Digital Markets Act, but then beyond that, the, the AI Act, all these proposed pieces of legislation, which definitely have a more paternalist, uh, you know, regulatory approach to some of these issues. Is do you see that really in terms of making perversely, in some ways, or ironically, 
in order to reach informational self-determination or preserve some degree of informational self-determination, we have to be more paternalistic. Is that the direction of travel uh, in, in Europe? I think, uh, yes, it is. And um, I think, um, I mean, paternalism has a very pejorative connotation in a certain respect, but I think in Europe, we do have a model of regulated capitalism, a model of, in Germany, what we call social market, um, social market economy. So in that respect, we have in many other spheres of life and of, um, in environment protection in terms of um, many other fields when it comes to pharmaceutics and other, other forms of markets, we already have some protection in place, which is consumer protection, but also protecting the, the environment and uh, the precautionary principle. So the AI Act, I think also talks about uh, subliminal practices of manipulation I mean, the question is how to spell that out in legal practice. Of course, it's a difficult term. And the question is whether these dark patterns uh, are addressed or whether normal forms of advertisement already con are considered as subliminal practices of manipulation. Um, but I think this form of trying to preserve certain values or certain um, certain discretion for individuals by setting some boundaries is something which I would call positive freedom, contributing to positive forms of liberty and not necessarily paternalism. I would also say that uh, in, in another act which is proposed, which is the Data Governance Act, of course, there is also a lot of euphemism about data sharing, public data sharing, but also so-called data altruism, which is, in my view, a little bit ambiguous because, of course, um, the question is whether there is still enough in individual control when it's um, based on a very broad consent or even on statutory um, rights of, uh, let's say, the state to get used to some data. But uh, interestingly, there is also a lot of discussion about intermediaries and fiduciary uh, trusts. I think this is even more pronounced in Britain right now. And the idea of PIMS, of personal information management system is also taking ground. There are not so many business models right now, um, but I think this is also a way of creating something like an, a third instance. So it's not only the citizen vis-a-vis -vis the state, the citizen vis-a-vis -vis the corporations, but we might have something like more independent uh, um, fiduciary systems, which are based on stewardship to a stewardship relationship to the individuals giving their data, but also making, um, also defining some preferences. So I want to donate data, for instance, for certain forms of health research, but uh, possibly not for health research, which is um, racially biased or which is eugenic or something like that. So in that respect, I think this could also be a way forward to really um, have an evolution of data protection law or the, the idea of informational self-determination, which is not overloading the individual in terms of control because we just cannot control each and everything because uh, if we would set too much weight on the individual citizen, I think this is just uh, overburdening the individual. Um, I would uh, make, uh, like to make another comment. I think we very much talk about Europe or the European Union, China and the US, but I think there are other statements now, other conventions. I think convention uh, 108 of the Council of Europe has been very important in terms of being the first and only binding intergovernmental convention on data protection. Uh, 55 states have currently signed it. 
And um, it also has international appeal in terms of norm setting, in terms of acculturation of legislation that protects human rights. And there is another convention, which is called uh, 108 plus, which is the modernized version. And it sets rule for the era of big data and AI. And it was opened for signature already in 2018 and has been signed, signed by 43 states, uh, 15, 14, I think, have already ratified it. And it also uh, strengthens data subjects rights and introduces certain notification obligations to the supervisory authority. But it's also including some principles in terms of the proportionality of data collection uh, on principles of data minimization. And also it is expanding the idea of sensitive data uh, which requires a special protection to include genetic and biometric data, trade union membership, and ethnic origin. So in that respect, it also establishes new rights in the context of AI algorithmic decision-making. It calls for privacy by design and strengthens the power and independence of data protection authorities. So I think this is also a point which improves the legal basis for international cooperation. And for the Global South, I think the Council of Europe, which um, has 47 member states, is a major point of reference. And also just to, to uh, also note that the UNESCO on Tuesday adopted the UNESCO's recommendation on AI ethics. And it's a 28 page long recommendation, which also defines some red lines, such a, a, a call to ban social scoring and the use of artificial intelligence for mass surveillance. Um, also, it introduces the concept of ethical impact assessments and that governments should put in place some enforcement mechanism and remedial actions to make certain that human rights and fundamental freedoms and the rule of law are respected in the digital and the physical world. So I think in the international realm, there are some steps of what, uh, what um, you uh, refer to as, as digital constitutionalism, and I think we should take that into account as well. It's not just some countries or some regions which go along and um, are leaders. I think there is now uh, an awareness that we have to do something about new technologies um, which are automating decisions which might, in, in some respects, um, come under control by humans, or uh, I mean, we really have to be accommodated to our economic system, our values. So um, I think this is very positive in terms of coming back to the idea of divergence and, and convergence. I think there will be some common ground, at least on some issues. And of course, as always, there will also be divergence in terms of interpreting certain, certain rules. <clears throat> but I see there is a lot of convergence taking place right now. Thank you. You're very, very quite right to remind us of the Council of Europe's uh, Convention 108, which is, provides that very useful kind of stripped down version of the, uh, the EU data protection regime was shorn of some of its other connections, quite intricate connections with EU law and provides a, 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 an easier uh, kind of uh, framework for transposing into uh, non-EU legal regimes. I wonder, Irene, if there have been any questions that- uh, There are no questions yet from the um, audience online. So if anybody has a question, please use the question and answer box. But uh, it would be great if we will open the, for the last, yeah, we just have 10 minutes left. So to the people here, give actually a priority <laughs> to them what came all the way to uh, 
to Russian Square. So if you have any any question, please introduce yourself. Then uh, it is either there to one of the panelists or. The, Yes. Sort of different angle of interest on all of this, but I have a few questions. But I just want the first one is the what about the we've all been hearing about the role of the fossil lobby and how we, governments have been unable to regulate in terms of environmental protection. What, what's the role of the big tech lobby in all of this regulation? They're so powerful now, um, you know, they're more powerful than a lot of individual states. Um, yeah, but, maybe let's let's see if there is uh, any other question we can take all of them. Uh, yes, please. Hi, uh, Sam Crawford, a PhD student at uh, Um, I'm interested in the law enforcement better processing angle here. So we've talked a lot about GDPR, but there's obviously also the EU law enforcement directive. And I wonder, you know, is there a possible text with regards to that? I mean, I've talked about the, I think, the return of privacy act back in before and the Fourth Amendment, but you know, that's, I would say, probably has a lot more exceptions than the law enforcement does. And my understanding of the Chinese model is it doesn't really regulate law enforcement. So I was wondering if you can take the comment on America and the Chinese language. Um. Okay, so, so leading off with, um, your question, um, and uh, I saw a, a reference earlier this week, so there had been some disclosure, I think in the United States actually, of uh, congratulation in, amongst Google, their effectiveness in delaying the privacy regulation over a, a very long time. And, and so that's evidence of just how you know powerful that lobby is, uh, has been in, in Europe and, and has shaped actually some aspects of EU data protection law. But, I thought it'd be interesting to have the view from China where we have a different group of big tech companies and what has their influence been in the development of data protection law in China? I think, um, well, I think it, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise that uh, the regulation in China is very heavy handed. And I think that applies to big techs as well. I think recently um, the government has uh, taking actions against uh, Tencent, which is one of the biggest tech companies in China, in terms of their uh, market uh, or commercial practices. So I think if you frame it as a positive step ahead uh, or step forward, um, they, they are the government is taking action. It's trying to tame the big tax, right? But then of course, uh, if you think of uh, the right to conduct business as a fundamental right, which is uh, the case in, in, in the EU anyway, uh, then you would also question whether that is the right approach, because at the end of the day, you don't want the government to interfere too much, uh, especially when it comes to the uh, private businesses, right? So uh, yeah, I don't really have a conclusion. Uh, but from the Chinese experience, I think it's fair to say there are heavy handed uh, measures, uh, whether that is effective or not in terms of protecting the fundamental rights of individuals. I think it's too early to answer that question. I suppose just to follow up and, and, and before getting to yours is, is to then ask is, um, you know, one of the questions when asked about data protection law is who's making the standards because we have all these principles, but then it is uh, in especially areas of new kinds of services and innovations is the companies themselves. Um, and that's something in the United States, Ari Waldman has written a lot about it, is that it's the companies that are putting those, they're laying down the track. And so in China, in terms of we've got all this new legislation, but to what extent are Alibaba, Tencent, uh, ByteDance and uh, Meituan and, and the other companies, are they really uh, very much in the game of deciding how what data privacy data protection is going to look like on the ground in China? I really don't know. You know what? That 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 requires some insights 
insider information, and I, I don't think I have uh, enough sort of insights to answer that question. But um, I don't know, just just from the look of how they were sort of, they were, I would say they were forced on their knees in some cases. I don't really see a lot of influence from these companies when it comes to policy making. That's my observation anyway. Well, I just I just give a, a, a very quick anecdote. And I was uh, in a conference in Beijing in uh, about 2012, and there was a discussion then of European data protection law. And the, a representative of Tencent stood up and said, "You know, the reason why Europe has no big data companies is data protection. And fortunately, in China, we don't have it. <laughs> so <laughs> some things have changed since then. But coming then to your question about law enforcement, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's the area, and that's something I want to bring up at the public-private split that that runs through data protection, and then like turning first to the United States and just asking, you know, one way to focus it would be the Carpenter decision in relation to the Fourth Amendment and the whole issue of sharing of data, and and beginning to change the the model of in terms of uh, what is fair for the state. To, to how much surveillance should so, you be under? So one of the things that I'm uh, really keenly interested in is law enforcement access to data across borders. Um, and so uh, and you have, you know, the US actually feels that the rest of the world has too little due process rights. That is, it feels that like Europe has too little due process rights, typically. Uh, and so the United States, uh, part of the USA, Cloud Act permits the executive to negotiate uh, uh, with other countries to, uh, to have a smoother system for information exchange, cross-border information exchange for law enforcement purposes. The US has only been able to reach one deal, uh, finding the UK having sufficient protections for uh, essentially the accused uh, in, these, in these kinds of matters. Uh, it hasn't negotiated any such agreements with the rest of Europe. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's largely yet a failed uh, enterprise. <laughs> you can only get one other country that you think is uh, kosher to send information to for law enforcement access purposes, and otherwise force them through uh, a failed MLATS process or with countries that we don't have an MLAT with no process uh, you know, to get uh, data. So uh, the US, I think, uh, has been very strict on these things. And for me, sometimes I, I worry that the US is, so the US essentially says there's a minimum standard of due process that must be followed in foreign country before an American company that holds data in the United States on a countryman of X uh, who has committed an ostensible crime in X for which the authorities seek data. Now, we impose our due process rules on jurisdiction X because of the physical location of that computer server. Um, and that, you know, I understand the, the some minimum requirements, but it seems to me the minimum requirements have just, if we can't make any deals with lots of democracies across the world, uh, I think we're, uh, that is a problem uh, for law enforcement access to data across the world. I mean, here, you know, I've heard in India, strong complaints from the Indian government, we can't do local law enforcement because American companies won't give us data because it's a violation of American law for those companies to give that data to any foreign country outside the MLAT process, outside the USA cloud process. Uh, so, uh, and that's privacy law, essentially, that, by, that makes it a violation to give that information to the uh, law enforcement authority in another country. So this is again, the tension between privacy law and other important interests in the world. Thank you, Anna Pambi. So it was a, 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 you know, a far ranging question. Maybe yeah. you'd like to pr pursue it with some of the panel afterwards. But 
Um, Ingrid, did you have any comments on those questions before we, we close the event? Yeah, maybe maybe just a short comment. Uh, I think, of course, uh, the the power of big tech, uh, especially in for Europe, it's the GAFAM companies, is one of the reasons why there have been so many initiatives by the European Commission to tame these powers in terms of competition law, in terms of AI regulation, in terms of Data Governance Act, and of course, it has. A double, a double intention. One is to regain economic power in terms also of initiatives like Gaia X um, to, to really create a European cloud service. So, uh, and also to create European champions because um, the dependency is so strong nowadays from those large tech companies. Um, and of course, law enforcement is a major Achilles heel when it comes to data protection, but also to competition law. So uh, there's a lot to be done, but I think um, the new in initiatives also tackle the interface between competition law on the one hand and data protection law and also consumer protection law. So I think these are important developments we will see, I think data localization is a major uh, controversy in the international sphere as well, because as, as you said, in India, they say we want to preserve data, data localization rules. The same is also true for the USMCA between United States, Canada and, and Mexico. So for instance, Mexico is not allowed to proscribe to Mexican companies to, to or even to international other international corporations to store their data on Mexican territory. So in that respect, um, I think there, there will be also in the international trade agreements, uh, in WTO sphere, there will be more controversies to come when it comes to, to things like cloud services, to think like cross-border trade of data, and of course, um, data flows are international. The whole idea of the internet was to enable the free flow of data. So um, to combine that with um, national jurisdictions and territorial law is and will in the future also be a major challenge. But it has to be tackled, I think, in a way which really preserves fundamental rights and also some economic uh, spheres of discretion. Thank you, Ingrid. Irene, if you want to. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are, uh, we are closing the event, so just a huge thanks to Ingrid for uh, joining us and Japan uh, and and Kelly for a very uh, interesting discussion today. And looking forward to continue the conversation here uh, a bit longer. And uh, this event has been uh, recorded, so it's going to be also available on the website. Um, on the website. Thank you. Thank you very much.